In a perfect world, starting up a serializer-deserializer pair that connects a camera to a controller or a controller to a display would be as simple as applying power. Yeah, but that's in a perfect world. In the real world, there are lots of factors to consider. Some that impact your selection of the serializer-deserializer pair, and some that you have to configure once everything's connected. Now, in a way, we've already identified two use cases. A video source connects to the electronics control module, or the ECM connects to a video sync, most often a display. Let's start with a case in which the serializer connects to a video source. If the video source is a camera module, the module may generate a pixel clock and parallel data, most frequently in the YUV color space, but possibly RGB or some other color space entirely. Parallel interfaces used to be pretty much the standard way camera modules connected, but today camera modules often interface using CSI2, a kind of serial interface that consists most frequently of one to four differential data lanes and a differential clock signal. The video data appears in certain bit times relative to the pixel clock the camera generates. But what if the video source isn't a camera at all? What if it's a video player? Well, then the output is most likely an HDMI signal. Now, depending on the version of HDMI, the exact details are going to vary. But at its core, HDMI consists of three differential data lines and one differential clock line. A serializer designed for an HDMI application has to convert the data on those data lines to parallel format before the serialization can even begin. The other use case is where the serializer connects to the ECM and the deserializer connects to a display. Okay, what kind of signaling does the display expect? Once again, very simple display panels might accept RGB parallel signals, but more frequently, embedded displays might use an LVDS interface. Again, multiple lanes of bit streams with the particular bit assignments given by the display manufacturer. Taken together, you can see that it's kind of unreasonable to expect a single serializer-deserializer pair to handle every one of these use cases. And that's why Maxim makes so many of these devices. With all the interfaces out there, you need a wide range of chips to get everything to play together. So the first big question you're going to need to ask is this. Is my serializer connecting to a video source like a camera? Or is it connecting to an electronics control module? Why does that matter? Well, the answer is control. One way or another, the electronics control module is going to configure both the serializer and the deserializer, regardless of which device has the actual connection to the ECM. And in GMSL1, the control link from the serializer to the deserializer is quite different than the control link from the deserializer back to the serializer. And that means that if the serializer connects to a video source, then the deserializer will connect to the ECM and the microcontroller in the ECM will configure the serializer by sending commands on the reverse control link that comes from the deserializer. Now the great thing about the reverse control link is that it works even in the absence of a video signal coming from the video source. And that's a good thing because until it's configured, the serializer may not know what to do with the parallel inputs that it sees. And that's great as far as it goes. But remember, the configuration connection is two-way. Now, in this instance, the deserializer sends configuration information to the serializer, and the serializer must send back an acknowledge indication. But how can it? The video link isn't established yet. Well, not to worry. Even if there were no pixel clock, the serializer can still establish a configuration link that the deserializer can recognize. Now, this is a temporary link that lets the serializer send acknowledgments to the deserializer until it can get a working video link established. But if the serializer connects to the ECM, then the deserializer will connect to a display most likely. The configuration path from the serializer to the deserializer is carried in a single bit in every pixel frame. 
Well, that's for GMSL1, but what about GMSL2? Well, in GMSL2, video data is not sent as a set of pixel frames that are synchronized to the source pixel clock. Instead, video data is sent as a series of packets. The transport, the serial bitstream, doesn't know or even care what's inside those packets. It might be video data, audio data, or control data. And the control channel is established as soon as the serial link is up. And, since GMSL2 is a packetized protocol, a small amount of the total bandwidth can be allocated to the reverse control channel, so there's no reason to set aside a separate subcarrier. To summarize, whether you're using GMSL1 or GMSL2, and whether it's the serializer or the deserializer connected to the electronics control unit, the ECM can configure all the devices in the system without additional wiring. So, how do we start up a serializer-deserializer system? Well, the truth is, it depends on the chip. And today, we're going to take a look at a few serializers and see how they configure themselves at PowerUp. Let's start with a Max 9277. It's a serializer designed to interface displays with LVDS interfaces. This serializer supports a serial link that runs at 3.12 GHz. So, what do you need to configure? Well, let's just run down some of the items. To start, this device supports both coax and shielded twisted pair, so you need to know what kind of cable you're driving. You need to know the number of bits per pixel frame, 24, 27, or 32. And you're going to need to configure the interface pins to support the kind of interface used by your micro, either I2C or UART. Now there are finer points, whether you'll use a low data rate mode because of a slow pixel clock, and whether you'll enable spread spectrum on the serial link. And then there's a biggie. What's the device address for this serializer in the first place? Well, in the Max 9277, all of these questions are resolved at power up in the state of seven pins. Let's take a look at them. Two pins, 27 and 36, are the configuration pins. CONF1 and CONF0. Each pin has three states. You can pull it high, pull it low, or just leave it open. So, two pins, three states per pin, that's nine possible states. And as you can see in this table, those nine states manage three of the things that we need to configure at startup. The control interface type selection, spread spectrum operation, and low data rate mode. Two more pins, that's pins 40 and 46, behave the same way. These are ADD0 and ADD1, and they set the device address for the serializer according to this table. In this way, you can make sure that the address assigned to the serializer doesn't conflict with any other device on the bus. And if you're using the companion deserializer, the MAX9276 on the other end of the connection, We'll just match the ADD0 and ADD1 inputs. Then, to get the equivalent deserializer address, just add 16 to the serializer address. Easy. Next, take a look at the BWS pin. That's pin 41. Now, it's also a three state pin. If this pin is low, then you're selecting 24 bit mode. If you leave it open, you're selecting 27 bit mode. And if you pull the pin high, you're selecting 32-bit mode. But this serializer accepts LVDS inputs, not, strictly speaking, parallel inputs. LVDS is a serial interface organized into multiple data lanes, with each lane carrying 7 bits per pixel clock cycle. So, let's think about this. Three data lanes gives you 21 bits of payload. Huh. 21 payload bits and a minimum of 24 bits on the serial bus. Seems like we're going to need at least four lanes to fill up the serial bus, right? Well, no. Remember, not all the bits on the serial bus are payload bits. There's a parity check bit. There's a forward control channel bit. In this serializer, there's an audio bit. And three bits for sync. No. In 24-bit mode, you only get 18 bits of actual video data. 
and three lanes are going to serve nicely. Now let's think about 27-bit mode, and I can kind of guess what you're thinking. Three more bits, so I can support 21 video bits, right? Well, no, not actually. 27-bit mode is also called high bandwidth mode, and in this serializer, it doesn't just engage the 9B, 10B encoder, it also turns on control channel encoding. Now, encoding the control channel into special words on the serial bus frees up the HS, VS, and DE positions in the bitstream. So instead of 21 video bits, I get 24 video bits. And that's 8 bits per primary color if I'm using the RGB color space. In any event, now I'm firmly in the four data lane camp. 24 bits is more than you can squeeze into three lanes of 7 bits each. That leaves 32-bit mode, and in 32-bit mode the sync bits are back, but so are a pair of control bits that can be used for pretty much any purpose. So, you see, there are a lot of functions packed into that one BWS control line. Okay, we've covered five of the pins, and that leaves two more. The Auto S pin on pin 45 tells the serializer to start the serial data line as soon as it's ready. Now, if that pin is inactive, the serial bus also stays inactive until it's explicitly started. And finally, there's a separate pin to select whether the outputs are configured to drive 50 ohm coax or 100 ohm shielded twisted pair. That device certainly gave us a lot of options, but at least now we have a baseline. Let's take a look at another serializer, the MAX 96705A. In terms of configuration pins, it's really not too different from the MAX 9277, but the differences that are there are important. First, just like the MAX 9277, there are two configuration pins, CONF1 and CONF0. The configuration pins are three-state, just like the MAX 9277, but in this device, the pins select whether the control interface is I2C or UART, whether the serial bus drivers are configured for coax or STP, and uh, there's a new one, whether the data on the parallel line should be sampled on the rising or the falling edge of the pixel clock. W wait, why didn't we need this on the MAX 9277? because the MAX 9277 used an LVDS interface, and an LVDS interface predefines what the edges of the pixel clock mean. The MAX 96705A has a true parallel input, and cameras with parallel inputs may change the data state on the rising edge or on the falling edge. There is no universal standard. So, if the ECM changes the state of the parallel output on the falling edge, then the serializer needs to sample the state of the output on the rising edge. Other configuration options, like bandwidth select, sync encoding, and double mode, are all expressed on their own pins and they're latched at startup. Plus, there's a new pin that selects high immunity mode for the reverse control channel. Now, this mode has to be enabled at both ends of the connection, but it makes the control channel much more robust and able to carry more data. But did you notice anything missing? What about 27-bit mode? Hey, doesn't this part have a 9B-10B encoder to enable that mode? Well, yes, it does. It's just that 27-bit mode is not a power-up default option. To enable 27-bit mode, the serializer has to be programmed for it, either by a local microcontroller on its local control interface, or, more frequently, by the ECM over the reverse control channel. And there's a point here. Since the reverse control channel is present, whether or not the video link's active, anything that can't be selected as a power-up default can always be configured at the command of the microcontroller that's attached to the deserializer. And that effectively defers the decision about how to configure the serial interface to the software design stage, instead of locking in the configuration at the hardware design stage. 
Now, going the complete opposite way is the Max 9291. It has separate pins for pretty much every configuration option we've covered. In this device, selection of the control interface, selection of the serial medium, data rate selection, spread spectrum, and auto start are all on separate pins. Software doesn't have to worry about configuration. But since this is an HDMI serializer, the ECM will have to load display information into the extended display identification data registers so that the serializer can properly format the data for the display. But once that's done, the serializer and deserializer should be able to communicate based on the state of these pins. But if the Max 9291 swings the needle pretty far into the every option on a pin territory, the Max 96701 family goes in the other direction. Only the control channel immunity selection is expressed on a pin. Every other option is selected by the managing microcontroller, either over the I2C interface or the control channel. Now let's look at one last part, the MAX 9295. This part supports both GMSL1 and the newer GMSL2. Now, GMSL2 works quite a bit differently from GMSL1, where the video input stream and the serial output stream are pretty tightly coupled in GMSL1. In GMSL2, the serial data stream runs at a constant rate and serves as a transport for video packets that arrive at the serializer at, well, whatever rate the video source needs. And the initial configuration is quite different too. Just look at the pin complement. There are only two pins, config 0 on pin 3 and config 1 on pin 4. Now, some of the parts we've seen in this video had normal two-state digital configuration pins, while others had three-state pins. Well, this part does better. Each configuration pin reflects eight possible voltage states, and you set it with a pair of resistors that make up a voltage divider. The state of the pin is latched soon after power-up, and the operating mode of the device is locked in at that moment. Now, it can be changed, of course, just by using the normal programming procedures, but this sets the initial operating mode. Config0 selects the control interface, I2C or UART, and the device address according to this table. One pin, eight possible configurations. That's pin efficiency. Config1 controls three different configuration switches. The first switch is one we've seen before, whether the physical interface on the serial bus is coax or STP. The second switch is something that we haven't seen yet. It selects whether the device is going to operate in GMSL1 mode, the one that we all know and love, or GMSL2 mode, which, well, at least for now, is a little mysterious. The final switch controls a different parameter depending on whether the device is operating in GMSL1 or GMSL2 mode. If it's running in GMSL1 mode, this third switch controls whether the device uses high immunity coding in the reverse control channel, but, if it's running in GMSL2 mode, the switch controls whether the bit rate is 3 or 6 gigabits per second on the serial bus. We'll have much more to say about GMSL2, but the main thing to take away about GMSL2 is that the serial data stream is, well, really just a series of data packets that can carry video data, status, or control information. That means that the serial data stream is pretty much independent from the characteristics of either the video source or the video destination, and that makes configuring the serial connection in GMSL2 much simpler than in GMSL1. But the important message behind all of this is that one way or another, GMSL devices can be configured to start up in a mode that either gets the serial link running in a mutually compatible way, or that gets a control link established so that the electronics control module can configure both ends successfully. Stay tuned for more about Maxim's complete line of serializers and deserializers.